Hello and welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Andrew O'Hare, Executive Editor of Salon. Uh, we have an extremely interesting guest today, albeit a person that most American viewers and readers probably won't recognize. Uh, joining me is a uh, b former British, uh, I don't know if intelligence officer is accurate, Catherine Gunn. Would that be, would that be a correct? Um, uh, yes, I worked for um, GCHQ, which stands for Government Communications Headquarters, and it is the equivalent of the NSA here in the US. Um, and I was a Mandarin language linguist and translator. Linguist and translator. And so in general terms, and I know there are certain specifics about your work you still can't discuss, but in general terms, what GCHQ does, as you said, it's analogous to what the NSA does in the United States. Yeah. It, it uh, selectively, we hope, intercepts communications that are occurring between Britain and other places. Is mm. that is that well, roughly it's, correct? It signals intelligence. So it gathers yeah. um, any form of communication that is non-human. Um, not human in, human intelligence, which is, is the CIA branch and the famous you know MI6 branch. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Like, so we're not talking about sending spies into foreign countries, right? No. Right. No. We're talking about gathering communications, gathering signals communications, and, yeah. signals. Yes. Yes. Uh, and and so so your what you became known for is in the period right before the Iraq War, uh, you found out. I guess more or less accidentally, but you can tell us the story, that uh, the US through the NSA was trying to get the help of British intelligence to do what exactly? Well, right, this was literally right before um, uh, Kofi Annan's speech at the UN. Yep. Uh, so sorry, Co Colin, Colin Powell's Powell, speech yeah, at the Colin UN. Powell's so we're talking about 2003, probably. 2003, yeah. yeah. And it was, well, I, I got the email on uh, the 31st of uh, January, and it was a Friday. Um, and I and the email was addressed to, it was kind of basically forwarded down to a whole group of analysts, and that was approximately 100 people or so, and I happened mm -hmm. to be one of them. Um, and so it was an email from a guy called Frank Koza who worked, he was the head of regional targets at NSA. And it, it was basically a request from the NSA to GCHQ to um, basically they, they, it just said, we want all the information you can gather on the uh, personal or um, the domestic or office communications of the six uh, delegates that were sitting on the UN Security Council, the swing nations. Yeah. So these were nations that move around, and they had the they were the non permanent members of the UN Security right. Council, and they had the kind of balance of the vote. So there was going to be a UN resolution which would um, they wanted the US and the UK wanted this UN resolution which would authorize an invasion of Iraq. Right. And so they, the request was, before this resolution took place, they wanted um, to have information on these um, diplomats so that they could th twist their arms. The diplomats from these six nations? Yeah, the diplomats from these six swing sat nations the that sat on the Security the Council. And they wanted any information, and it says specifically, any, all, the whole gamut of information, this is quote, whole gamut of information that would give the U.S. policymakers an edge in achieving goals favorable to U.S. Uh, or, yeah, U U goals favorable to the U.S. So um, I was just stunned by this. You know, I was, I was appalled and I was shocked. One of the ways this has been, uh, this has been presented and is presented, we're going to talk about the movie, which is not a documentary, but the movie in which you appear as a character. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this has been presented as an attempt, or at least a, the solicitation of an attempt, to blackmail yeah. potentially these people. Is that yeah. how you read it at the time? Absolutely, yes. It was either blackmailing them, or bribing them, or threatening them. You know, not just them, but their countries. That you know, it was um, really immoral, unethical behavior. So the, the the kinds of things that could have been desired might have been embarrassing personal information. Right. I mean, if, if someone is having an extramarital affair, right. we want to know about that. Right. That sort of thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is, let's face it, not absolutely not relevant to the question of whether of whether the U.S. and and Britain should go to war in Iraq, right? Exactly. So, right. So, all right. So you you come into possession of this, and you say that about uh, roughly a hundred other people, maybe mm. at GCHQ, 
in, in the movie, which is called Official Secrets, let's just mention that, which comes out in the United States at the end of August. We will circle back to that. Um, it, it is presented that you did, you, did, you did discuss this memo at least a little bit with colleagues at GCHQ. Is that correct? Yeah, that's an interesting point. A lot of this whole story is very internal, okay? Yeah. Because um, it's just about me and my internal monologue and my thought processes. But how do you portray that in film? Sure. So actually, no, I didn't discuss it with anybody at work. Um, and in fact, we rarely discussed anything of any political interest. Which I can, um, I can well imagine, that it's right. sort, of, that's sort of probably discouraged. Yeah, it's, it's just, it doesn't happen, and it's kind of the usual office environment of gossip and intrigue. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, unless you, you're focused on a very specific uh, target, maybe in your section, then you might be talking about those particular characters and so on. But the general news that's going on at the time, we didn't really focus on it. So the whole thing was going on in my head. But of course, the, the, just to remind people, uh, many of you were there, but what was going on was that George W. Bush, with the uh, extremely devoted assistance of Tony Blair, who was mm -hmm. prime minister in Britain at the time, were seeking uh, to go to war with Iraq mm -hmm. on the pretext mm -hmm. that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. We know how that all turned out. But I'm sorry, you were going to... Well, the thing is, as Gavin Hood, uh, the director of the film, has yeah. pointed out, you know, there are two, two normal routine ways to uh, launch a war. And the first one is to get UN cover. Yeah. And the second one is in self-defense. So they were desperate. And Tony <laughs> Blair, yeah. especially Tony Blair, was desperate to get UN cover. You know, that, that, I think that was his main kind of um, bargaining chip with George Bush, was that we have to get this UN cover Wait, for his own legitimacy. Because that made him look less like a lapdog of the United States? Well, and perhaps? also, yeah, you know, and also um, himself being a lawyer, you know, yeah. it's, uh, so anyway, um, leaking the memo essentially blew that up in their faces. Right. Um, and that wasn't my intention. My intention was to prevent the war. But anyway, we'll get to that. <laughs> yes. So, so all right. So you have the, the memo in your possession. What did you do with it? What was, what was uh, So I really felt step? that time was absolutely pressing. Sure. That there was no time to take it up to any of my superiors. And anyway, I felt they would just sweep it under the rug and they would keep an extra special eye on me and not let me, you know, they, it would be like flagging me up as someone to keep an eye on. And... Uh, so I felt I had to get it out to the public. Um, and although I didn't do anything on Friday, I went home and I thought about it over the weekend. I contacted someone I knew um, who had this contact in the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, I've got something which I think is explosive. Um, you know, will you help me get it out? And she, she or he said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yes, very um, good off a copy of the memo and and you know immediately I felt like I was just basically I had a target on my back you know? and I folded yeah. I folded up and put it in my handbag just as Kira Knightley does and uh, and uh, and then I walked out of GCHQ with it in my bag and were the so they really didn't have any uh, at the time any security measures that would automatically note that you had printed this out. Well, I mean, people pre why. print things print out things all, all the, the time. time. I yeah. mean, I don't know what happens now in the digital age, but back then it was quite normal to print things out and send them as a kind of, you know, document mm -hmm. it to other people. So uh, that was not an immediate, you know, kind of concern or risk type of thing. Um, I don't know how often they scrutinize people's bags when they're going in and out of, of work. Um, but still, you know, I, I was extremely nervous. Yeah, I'm sure. And did you, did you, as depicted in the film, physically pass a piece of paper to someone? Is that, is that how this worked? What actually happened was I mailed it. Okay. So it went in the snail what, mail. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they got it in a couple of days. And yeah, that's how it happened. Which is still, that sort of... Um, low-tech maneuver is still one of the best ways to avoid detection, correct? Well, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, 
So how long did it take from the time you delivered this to someone to its actual appearance in the press then? Because that was when this all yeah. broke out into the open. Well, it didn't actually come out in the press until I think it was the 2nd of March. Mm -hmm. So almost a whole month passed. Um, I went on the anti-war protest in London on the... Sure, big ones, yeah, yes. Yeah, February the 15th. Um, and by that point, I'd kind of given up hope. I was thinking that maybe it wasn't going to come out. Maybe it wasn't really as relevant as I thought it was. And anyway, I was so bowled over by the protests that I thought, surely this is going to, you know, this is sending the message to Tony Blair that we do not want to go yeah. to war. And I was absolutely, you know, it was such a spine-tingling historical moment. Um, but despite all that, they went to war. Yeah, millions of people marched around the world, yeah. as, as we know, many, many, including the United States, yeah. large numbers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that didn't didn't prevent it. No. Absolutely did not prevent it. So no. it was so then it appears in the Observer. So right? then it appeared on in the Observer, which is a Sunday newspaper. And you know, it's a paper that I used to I used to buy regularly. So I went down to the shop and I and I went to pick up a copy of it and instantly, you know, it was right there on the front page, UN Dirty Tricks. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I recognized it straight away. And the memo itself was replicated on the front covers. And I knew, I knew the game was up. Um, I felt like I'd been ident identified just in that front page. Why did you think that? Well, because, you know, it was, I guess, naively I'd hoped or assumed that they would have just printed an article that maybe talked about a source, yeah. right? An intelligence source alleges that this is taking place. But I can see why they didn't do that. Right, they wanted to establish the credibility of and this. And they yeah. wanted the impact of the story, Yes. right? And silent. Because although I had promised, I, I had promised the contact that I'd passed the memo to, that I would say nothing, I would do nothing, I would remain silent on the issue, I realized I couldn't do that because I couldn't keep going to work pretending that I had nothing to do with it. And you also clearly made the decision not to do what uh, uh, famous American whistleblower Edward Snowden did and mm. do a runner, as you might say, show up somewhere else um, and what? start talking about it. That was not an option for you? Was that a personal decision or you, or, or? Well, no, it had never occurred to me. Okay. And anyway, I couldn't have run away because my husband wouldn't have been able to come with me. Right. And that's a whole other story. And um, so, no, I just, I just thought I had to take the rap for it. Um, and eventually, eventually I did, but initially I denied having any involvement in it. And then I realized that that wasn't a tangible um, route to go down and I wasn't going to be able to sustain that. So the following day I went back into the office and I told my manager that um, it had been me, in fact. And Was that because they were going to do uh, a sort of mole hunt, so to speak? Where they they were, did. They yeah. started straight away on Monday, and they were interviewing every single person who'd received that email um, and, gr you know, grilling down on them. And then, you know, eventually they would have wheedled out a few that they were extra suspicious about and then continued to grill them. And I just, you know, I mean, the whole thing just seemed like I could not carry on denying my involvement. And, um, and also it was utterly unfair on the other people who would become right. suspects. So Right. So you so you you copped to it. You you, you told the truth. And what happened then? Well, I, uh, the movie is called Official Secrets, which is a reference to the Official Secrets Act, which is the mm -hmm. government act in Britain that covers mm -hmm. revealing which you have to sign to right. work for. Right. Right. So yeah. you you had certainly technically violated something yeah. that you had signed. So what were you arrested? What happened after that? Well, immediately after that, I um, was taken to the internal security section of GCHQ where I recounted my actions, but I refused to name the contact that I gave it to. And then, um, and, they, and they'd, in the meantime, had called London's um, special branch down to arrest me. Mm. Um, and I was taken away in an unmarked car to the local police station where they held me in um, Special overnight. Special branch being a term in Britain that carries a, a pretty 
particular and slightly fearsome meaning. Right? Well, Metropolitan Police, but it's, yeah, they're, they're focused on the more serious crime and especially anything to do with these sorts of issues, mm -hmm. intelligence issues and so on, yeah. So, um, and you were charged under the Official Secrets Act eventually. Eventually, yeah. 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 And, but the ending of the story is interesting, and I, obviously this, the, the movie gets into this. And uh, by the way, I have to have a parenthesis because I, I'm always fascinated by what this is like. For somebody who has who spent most of your life, probably before and after this incident of fame, leading a fairly normal existence with no intention of becoming famous, what's the experience like to see yourself portrayed on film by a famous actress? Is it peculiar? Of, well, of course. <laughs> I guess that's a dumb question. But, but yeah, I, I, I mean, it's not something I would ever, ever have conceived of, right? First of all, I never set out to be a whistleblower. Yeah. Secondly, I never expected that my story would be interesting to anybody. And third of all, um, you know, I was actually, I was terrified of being named, of being mm -hmm. identified. So when I was, first of all, when I was arrested, um, I wasn't named. Uh, oh, that's at, interesting, okay. Yeah, so because I hadn't been charged, I wasn't charged until November 2003. So for eight months I was bailed, and I was caught month by month I was being bailed, and they didn't name me publicly, and I was trying really hard to maintain this kind of life whereby I was pretending I was just on a, you know, I was on some kind of study course right. from GCG. Right, obviously they didn't have you going to work during that Right, time. I, yeah. I had yeah. been suspended from work. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then when they did charge me and my name came out, I was just terrified. I was terrified that suddenly I would be known everywhere I went. But in actual fact, nobody knows me, <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you did not, uh, although there, you certainly had a moment in Britain where people read about you, you didn't turn into, I'm sure you are somewhat familiar with the case of Valerie Plame, mm -hmm. former CIA agent in the United States who became the center of a political controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't happen exactly with you, right? No, or, I mean, I, I guess I didn't seek the limelight. So when the, well, at the end of, I don't want to give the story away totally, yeah, but absolutely. at the end, um, I just wanted to disappear back into anonymity. So I had uh, kind of a, a full day of doing press interviews in London and talking, you know, to all the TV personnel, all the um, famous interviewers. Um, and then I said, that's it, I'm not doing anymore. And I disappeared with my husband down to the coast uh, in Brighton, on the coast of England and just spent some time away from the limelight. And, um, and then, you know, the story went away. And that's how I wanted it at that time, because I was actually quite traumatized by the whole thing. I'm um, sure. And uh, it was very difficult for me to come to terms with what had happened. And um, although it was a tremendous relief that I wasn't going to suffer as much as I thought I was going to have indeed, to. Indeed, um, Yeah, there was an anticlimax. Max aspect to the whole issue, which, you know, now the great thing about this film is that it's brought the issues, hopefully it's going to bring the issues back into the limelight. And, um, and, and that's what I want the film to do. Because how do you perceive from this distance the sort of, you know, in terms of philosophy or, or politics or policy, the, the kind of end game or, or denouement here because Okay, you didn't stop the war from happening. The war no. happened anyway. But what you did did um, expose a great deal about the machinery behind the scenes mm -hmm. that led to the war, and it sure damaged Blair's government mm. uh, considerably. Yeah, um, although um, they, you know, they won the second election and they came yeah. back, and you know, again, you know, remarkably and very depressingly for myself and others is that you know he's being again brought out as the kind of wise statesman on various issues such as Brexit and you know <laughs> these people mm -hmm. their reputations despite the fact that you know from my point of view they're extremely damaged reputations um, and they have really I don't believe any moral authority to make any kind of public announcements 
but they're still being wheeled out on the BBC and <laughs> you know having articles in various newspapers and um, so I don't know how we address this situation. Well, I mean, I suppose we have our own version of that in that, I mean, I guess George W. Bush has had enough sense to stay out of the limelight, but there is still a sense in the United States, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that compared to the current um, yeah. uh, administration in Washington, he looks good. That, that's an invidious comparison, I Well, say, I vaguely but, remember that when Bush was president that people were saying that compared to Bush, Reagan was, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it seems like it's just, it's getting progressively worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, so that, yeah, that's certainly one aspect of it. And then, you know, we still seem very confused in Western societies about how to deal with these questions of, secrets and when to expose them and when they are the most damaging. Uh, I'm sure you watched the whole Snowden drama with some degree of personal interest. H how would you evaluate the decision that he made? I don't know. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, I've never met Snowden. I've never spoken with him personally. Um, I mean, he's extremely smart. Yeah, clearly. Very, yeah. very smart. Um, yeah, I mean, he, I guess he was a lot less naive than I was. I mean, I think I was pretty naive. I obviously, I didn't know how the game works, you know. I just, I felt there was a, this, this information that was absolutely crucial. It had the potential to derail the rush to war. And I, I felt people had the right to know. Um, I think Snowden, it's a philosophical argument, right? Um, and it's and and Julian Assange as well. I think those yeah. guys. It's a it's a phil philosophical argument. It's about whether you know the degree of transparency that um, you know we should expect from our governments and so on. Um, and that's a whole. I think that's a whole different topic. And of course, in both of those cases, the message has gotten extremely muddied recently. Mm. Uh, Snowden, I don't believe this was ever his intention, that's certainly what he said, but the fact that he has wound up living in Russia, it looks different now than it did at the time, mm. and to many people in the United States that, that creates uh, an, a whole set of assumptions about why he did what he did and yeah. how he wound up there, which may be completely unfair, I suspect yeah. it is unfair, yeah. but it creates a perception. Right. And of course the, the, the implication or evidence that Assange was involved in in the sort of uh, you know attacks uh, on Hillary Clinton in the mm. 2016 election mm. also creates yeah. this. And is, that, is it a little frustrating to see that these political issues get in the way of our being able to actually think clearly about these questions of... Yeah, I think to an extent it does. I mean, I don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I think at the, at the, in the beginning, um, Julian Assange and Snowden's argument was that the governments are lying to us. You know, I mean, Ed, Ed Snowden was uh, basically s saying the same things that Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and other U.S. whistleblowers yes. was, had said before him but he came out more publicly um, and, and maybe revealed more. Um, and it, it did show that, you know, the government, US government said we are not surveilling US citizens, but that was a lie. Yeah. Um, and Julian Assange did show us, you know, through the, the Iraq uh, war cables and so on, the absolute, you know, horrors of war and, and especially that video Yes. Um, and so on. Yes. So um, those are incredibly important issues that need to be discussed and need non-partisan type of answers to. Um, and I don't think it's helpful to uh, have all the other baggage associated with those issues. It's so difficult in either of our nations right now um, our country appears to be embroiled in this, you know, bitter partisan dispute that keeps getting kind of uglier and uglier, you know, just the stuff that happened this week. Mm. And uh, your country is consumed with... Equally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> arguably just as dumb in a different way. Right, but. right. Um, and I think, you know, I have 
got to the stage in my life where I'm really tired of all these partisan issues. I think the big issues are truth and justice and accountability in all sectors of society. You know, that is um, how, how things work at, to their best and most efficient mm -hmm. way. And so I think that's what we need to focus on is to go back to those things um, in the media, in the judiciary system, in the political system. I mean, I know it may be just a kind of hope and a dream that is n never materialized, but I think there are enough wise and capable and willing people who will be able to you know, help to direct us back in that direction. Well, maybe if we can survive the current set of crises, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, some people, I don't know if it's overly grandiose to say crisis of democratic legitimacy, but in both of our countries, there is an element of that. Yes. You know, people and, no longer feel faith. In, right, and I think that's why we see the backlash, you know, where yeah. people are just saying, we've had enough, we're sick of not being represented, re represented yeah. and we, we don't feel you have any legitimacy, and we reject your authority, and it's, it's, it's understandable, but it's dangerous. Yeah, I feel like the, the, uh, a significant proportion of the electorate in both countries decided we'd rather shoot ourselves in the foot <laughs> yeah. Then, then continue to trust the people right. that we've and there's a perverse way in which I can understand that psychologically mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it was a good idea right, right. <laughs> uh, Catherine Gunn is such a fascinating conversation uh, former whistleblower one time translator at GCHQ the government communications headquarters in the UK played by Kira Knightley in the new film Official Secrets which will be out in the United States at the end of August Catherine thank you so much thank you